So Yvonne and I are both from the same town in Michigan. We didn't know that until we met last week, but that's kind of fun. Um, she's educated, she's experienced, and really what I've seen is she has a, a big heart and a heart for healing communities and bringing God's kingdom to the world. So thank you for being here and teaching this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here in this place. We thank you that you teach us and you speak to us through your word and through your servants. And God, I ask that our hearts would be open, that you would fill this place with your presence, and that you would speak to Yvonne today. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Awesome. Thank you so much, Connections, for welcoming me here. Like John said, today feels like a divine connection for me. Um, just a few weeks back, I was asking the Lord what he wanted me to do with my October and how I was going to make some income and what I wanted to be doing versus what he wanted me to be doing. And all of that ended up with me saying, Lord, I'm going to take a step forward and do something schedule some things that I would like to do this month. And that meant that I was going to be actually stopping um, a little side gig and not having the income that I was expecting. And when I asked the Lord what he wanted me to know about that, it felt like in my soul, the Lord said, Yvonne, I can open doors that you can't open. And today is him opening a door that I could not have opened. <laughs> Although I live only six minutes from here, and I didn't know John from Adam <laughs> um, before just a week ago, um, a friend, Joy, texted John. John is neighbors with a friend of mine. My friend reaches out and says, hey, would you be available to come and bring the message to Connections Church in just a week? <laughs> and... Um, that filled um, a gap for me, and it definitely pairs so beautifully with what God has been doing in my own life. I have been a formation pastor at South Fellowship Church just maybe 10 minutes from here, and a year ago, God prompted me to take a step out and join a team of healers and really minister to people one-on-one -on -one and in community through prayer and healing sessions and we get the joy of bringing hope and healing back to the church and back to people that have lost hope. And so it's such a delight to be with you this week. I did end up showing up last week just to see your community and get to know you a little bit. And it's such a delight to, to hear miracles that are happening in your midst and the ways that God has given visions and and instructed people to walk in him. Um, it's been such a delight to get to know you just a smidge um, before coming to share with you this morning. But as I was driving here last week, again, I asked the Lord, what do you want me to know about Connections Church? And I just felt this, my heart break a little bit. And it felt like God was showing me that right now, Connections Church is a little heartbroken. And I say that, hopefully, to, that you hear that the Lord sees you. The Lord knows that there are some heavy things that are maybe weighing on your heart. And he, and he loves you and he is pursuing you. And I feel like today's even divine connection for us, me and you, to be together is a sign that he is with you and he is for you. And I hope that today, in just reminding us of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that today we can raise our hope together. Hope that he is good, that he is moving on our behalf, maybe behind the scenes, and that we would receive even deeper truth and be even more settled in the fact that there is nothing to be ashamed of in the gospel of Christ. Let's pray together. Father God, King Jesus, Holy Spirit, 
would you be the good father that we need you to be in this community and in our hearts today? Jesus, would you be the good friend? The one that Heather read earlier that is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. Holy Spirit, would you move amongst us today? We thank you that you don't just dwell far off, but that you dwell within and among us today. Lord, would you open our hearts that maybe feel weighed down or broken? So that we can more fully receive your truth and be strengthened in our faith today. We thank you, God, that you are a good God and that we can be in your presence receiving your love and belonging today and every day. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today, I'd love us to anchor in this passage. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. Let's read that together to get it in our system. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. When I read this, I feel like there's a glaring question. Do I believe this to be true? Do I feel it in my soul? Do I know that I'm not ashamed of the gospel? And friends, I've been walking with Jesus for a long time, but he is still teaching me about this verse. <laughs> and he is still teaching me that there are days when I'm weighed down and I'm feeling overwhelmed by the weight of the world, by the weight of my own hardship, by whatever's happening in front of me. And I feel the weight of shame. I feel like the enemy becomes my bully and he throws a whole bunch of shame arrows at me, grenades that want to destroy who I am that say, gosh, you're not enough. The problem must be you, Yvonne. Gosh, that happened again? You must have something wrong with you. And I wonder if you guys resonate with that, especially when life gets hard or when our hearts get broken. It's so easy for us to, to to not hold up a shield of faith and, and to extinguish the arrows of the enemy, but to let that faith come down and to let those arrows in and they get stuck when we're vulnerable. And when I look at this verse, I think, gosh, I want that to be my story. I want that to be my everyday where I stand up and say, I am not ashamed. This is good news and I walk a good story. And I'm excited that, that, that the enemy's arrows can't even get to me. But sometimes it feels like it's more aspirational than functional. Do you get me? Do you feel that way too? <laughs> and yet, Paul says, I am not ashamed. No shame. Absence of shame. Absence of shame. This word was too difficult in the Greek for me to say it to you, so I'm not going to use it. But I'm going to remind you that this is not the only time that Paul talks about this word, not ashamed. He really wants to pass on to his mentee, Timothy, that there's no reason to be afraid. So several times in Timothy, he writes to Timothy and says, don't be afraid of the testimony of our Lord. And he says, don't be ashamed of the fact that I'm in chains or in prison or that I'm suffering or going through hardship. 
He wants to, to eliminate shame. And I think that Paul has some secret sauce to understanding that we can walk in our faith with Jesus without shame. That sounds amazing, and I want that. So I'm hoping that we can get some wisdom from him today. I think one of the biggest things is that we don't quite understand shame. Maybe we think about shame in terms of the psychological definition, that shame is like the embarrassment and humiliation. That's what first comes to me. Even when Paul says that to Timothy, don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed that I'm in prison. There's no need to be embarrassed. And it's this humiliation that comes from a perception. We perceive that other people have thoughts about us, that they have thought that our behavior or our being is dishonorable, immoral, or improper. And I think that that's kind of a a good baseline of shame, but shame researcher Brene Brown, I think gets a little bit further, and I think it's a little closer to what Paul is talking about here when he says, I'm not ashamed. Shame is an intensely painful feeling and experience, and it's from that, that perception Perceptions turn to beliefs, and it's believing that we're flawed. And out of that place of being flawed, we are unworthy of love and belonging. So not only is it just that I feel some embarrassment or maybe my my body starts to be like, what do they think of me, right? It's that actually, no, I'm starting to, when those arrows come in from the enemy, It's not just someone's perception of me. It's that I, something's wrong with me, that I'm bad, that I'm flawed, that I don't don't deserve to be received with love and belonging. And so that's what the enemy wants to do to you when you are vulnerable. He wants to say that you are wrong that you are bad, that something's defective in you. And he gets at that point of identity. But friends, if you are feeling that, you are not alone. Because this is the whole story of the whole scriptures. It starts way back in the beginning with Adam and his wife, who were naked, completely exposed, completely who they are, And they felt no shame. Free. Wouldn't that be lovely? (laughs) But, right, we know how the story goes. Sometime later, right, they they disobey God. And then they realize, they look down and they say, like, I'm vulnerable. I'm naked. And so I got a cover. Oops, didn't mean to do that. They cover themselves and they hide from God. And in that place, when we think that we are bad, that we are flawed, that we are unworthy, that we don't deserve to be received again with love and belonging, we isolate, we separate, we cover. We self-protect because it's too vulnerable. (laughs) And in that place, the enemy only pummels us all the more with more messages that, gosh, I I don't deserve to be loved again. And it's this part of God's story that he says, where are you? Where are you? Not to make Adam and Eve feel bad. They already felt bad. That was their shame making them feel bad. God was calling them out of their shame. Saying, where are you? Who was it that told you that you were naked? I didn't tell you. Shame told you. 
Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? And in God's gentleness, even Paul, in this very book of Romans that he, that he writes to the Christians who were persecuted, he tells them that it's actually God's kindness that leads us to, to turn back to him. And it's this kindness that exposes what's true, exposes that the behavior of Adam and Eve was wrong. They did disobey. And there was appropriate guilt. But what was not appropriate was their shame. That they couldn't be loved, they couldn't be received from God. And so after Adam and Eve eats this forbidden fruit, instead they start to think these thoughts of shame. They think, gosh, I'm not, God's created us to be like him. And instead of being like him, I'm like this serpent. I'm like the animal. And I'm afraid and I'm in trouble and I must be bad and I must be unworthy of connecting with God. That was the shame narrative that was playing in Adam and Eve. But there's a big difference between guilt and, and the Lord exposing the behavior that was wrong and shame in believing that we cannot be loved. And that is what Paul is speaking into when he says, I am not ashamed. I don't have to feel like God isn't going to love me or connect with me because there's good news. He's not ashamed in the gospel, the good news, because the good news is the power of salvation. The power of salvation. Let me comment on this first, and then we're gonna go to the power of salvation. Paul knew, I think, that the shame narrative is a shame, is the enemy's attack on our identity. Similar to what we were talking about last week with God running, um, him just running after and pursuing a, a prostitute in the middle of Jericho and wanting to give her a new identity, to no longer be called prostitute, but to be called a part of God's family. I think that this is a, a similar thing that the enemy's going after is our identity. But I'd love for us to go this level deeper to talk about shame because shame tells us that our identity is flawed. And if we feel like the insides of us are flawed, no new label is gonna fix it. So I wanted to tell you a story because in my family, we first of all love when people get married. We also love to tease them. And so we love to play pranks. And when they get married and they go on their honeymoon, then usually there's something that they should anticipate that we've done to their house when they return. And one of the things that we would do is that we would take off the labels off of their canned goods so that they had no idea what was inside of it. <laughs> and we never put new labels on it, but just by putting a new label on the outside of a can doesn't change the inside of the can, right? So I think for a long, a long time, I've been trying to put on God's labels of his identity of me, saying, oh, Yvonne, you're a child of God. You are beloved, you are chosen. But if the insides of me feel crappy, and feel like I'm bad and that I suck and that maybe I'm just an imposter and that I shouldn't be here, the insides are gonna really tell me the truth, right? And so in order for this to work, it has to be a transformation. It's not just the outside being changed, it's the inside being changed. And I think that's what Paul is getting at when he says the power of salvation. This word, soteria, I can pronounce that one. This one, when I was looking at all the different ways that Paul uses this word salvation, one of them caught my eye. And this, the way that he uses salvation is later in Acts when he's out and shipwrecked and they're not eating any food. And he says that, that 
they need to go and eat meat in order that they would be saved. In the context of their bodies, they're going to need nutrients and substance inside in order that they can be rejuvenated and have the energy to keep living. So this word of salvation, he, even Paul uses it in the context of refilling after a long time of not eating, which I think is actually pretty fascinating when it comes to Paul's story of transformation. The reason that Paul can say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of salvation for everyone who believes, is because he lived it. We know his past, right? We know that he used to be Saul, the one that was trying to like be the best Jew he could possibly be, but in being the best, he was hurting a whole lot of people and he was hurting God. And it, God took him through a process of emptying those insides, I believe, and, and revigorating him and strengthening him in a new way. So I would love to read his story for us today. And I don't do this very often, but I'm going to use a different and very unique version. And if you don't care for other versions and you have your own stick, like you stick to one version, just hear me out. <laughs> Pretend that it's a children's story, okay? But this is a version that I'm just recently introduced to, so probably that's why it's like on the top of my radar and I want to share it with you today. This version has been written in translation of the Bible to First Nations, to tribal people who refer to one another by the purpose of their name, the meaning of their name. And I find this story of Saul to Paul's transformation so beautiful when you get to hear the meaning of each of their names in the story. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, you can close your eyes on this one and just receive this. This is the story of transformation and what Paul had to go through in order for him to know that he could be unashamed. Saul, the man who questions was on a rampage, breathing threats and murder against the followers of the honored chief, creator sets free. His name's Jesus. He went to the chief holy man and asked for the written documents to give the tribal leaders houses in the village of Silent Weaver. This would permit him to take any of the followers of the way, the men and women, and bind them in chains and make them and take them to the village of peace. So on his way to Silent Weaver, just as he came near the village, without a warning, a light from the spirit world above shone down all around him and he fell down to the ground and he heard a voice speaking man who questions, man who questions, the voice called out his name twice. Why are you pursuing and mistreating me? Man who questions trembled with fear at the sound of the voice that was coming from the blinding light. Honored one, he asked, who are you? I am creator sets free, the voice answered. The one you are pursuing and mistreating. Now stand to your feet and go to the village. There you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood silent, saying nothing, for they heard the voice and saw no one. Man who questioned stood to his feet and opened his eyes, but he could not see. The ones who were with him took him by the hand and guided him into the village of Silent Weaver. He stayed there without eating or drinking. And after three days, he still could not see. Now in the village, 
There was a man named Creator Shows Kindness, Ananias. A follower of Creator Sets Free. He was given a special vision from the Great Spirit. Creator Shows Kindness, the voice called out in a vision. I am here, honored one, he answered back. Get up and go to the house of Speaks Well Of. And on the village pathway called Straight, there you, will at, you must ask for a man from Tree Village whose name is Man Who Questions. He is praying right now. And in a vision, he has seen a man with your name come to him and lay hands on him so that he might see again. Honored one, creator shows kindness, answered back. I've heard of this man and how much harm he's done to the holy people in village of peace. The head holy man has given him authority to put in prison all who call on your name. Go to him, creator sets free, answered. For I have chosen this man to represent me to the outside nations, to the rulers and to the tribes of wrestles with creator, Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer in order to represent who I am. Creator shows kindness, followed the guidance given to him in the vision and went to the house. And there he placed his hands on man who questions. Man who questions, my brother. He asked him, Creator sets free. Our honored chief, the one who appeared to you on the road, has sent me to you so that you may see again and be filled with his Holy Spirit. Right then, something like fish scales fell down from his eyes and he could see again. He stood up and went to participate in the purification ceremony. After that, he ate some food and his strength returned. He stayed in the village of Silent Weaver for a few days with some followers of Creator Set Free. And right away, he went to the local gathering houses and began to tell them that Creator Sets Free is the son of the Great Spirit. And all who heard them could not believe their ears. Thanks be to God. <laughs> This beautiful story of Saul's transformation. Was him coming to terms with the fact that he was persecuting God. He was guilty on all accounts of hurting God. And God sent him through a process. And I'm, I'm going to be really curious when I meet Paul one day to ask him what he was praying about and what those three days were like when he was blind. <laughs> because I think that the Lord, I mean, physically he was fasting. He wasn't eating anything. He was, he was getting everything out <laughs> inside. In order that then God could even use community to come around him and show him that he had not, no need to be ashamed. Imagine the very person that you, the, the type of person that you've been murdering and killing is now coming to lay hands on you and reconcile and say, you, Saul, we know you're the one who questions. We know you're the one who's trying to be the, the best Jewish leader that you possibly can be and you're doing it for God. But, but we know that you've got it wrong and that we want to welcome you with love and belonging into the way of Jesus. And that's the same thing. That's the same good news and the power of salvation, that restorative power when we lay down our shame. And so I think it would be really great to enter into a prayer practice right now. To just let the Lord expose anything that's inside in order that it can be removed and that you can be refilled with the truth of who you really are, of who God really says that you are. So if you wouldn't mind, just close your eyes. 
And imagine yourself in this story. Imagine yourself walking down a path. And on that path, just, just get the surroundings. What does it look like? What kind of day is it out? And as you're walking this path, what are the things that you're saying about yourself? Any ways that you're believing that you are flawed or unworthy? That you don't belong. That what you've done says that you're bad. And we can feel really heavy when that happens. I don't know if that you feel that in your body. But just imagine that all of a sudden, this incredible light shines everywhere around you. And the best kind of feeling of love surrounds you. You are seen, you are loved, you are known. And the creator sets free, comes and says, where are you? Creator sets free, says, what are you telling yourself about who you are? And creator sets free, wants to take those names from you. So would you just hand those to him? Whatever messages you're believing about yourself, hand them to him. I'm unloved. I don't deserve your grace. I'm unworthy. And then just watch what he does with those names. He knows. He sees. But that has not changed his love over you. So let yourself feel what love feels like. Maybe it feels like an embrace. Maybe it feels like a shoulder to cry on. Maybe it feels like him lifting your head. Creator sets free is in the business of trade. He trades your Morning, and what he wants to give you is joy. <laughs> he takes your despair and gives you hope. He takes your shame and gives you inheritance and new identity. And so we'll just ask Creator Sets Free right now, who is it that you say that I am? Beloved, redeemed, new, delighted in. And feel what that feels like in your system. It's like 
eating a new meal after you've fasted for a long time. Like that's salvation. That is what he offers you. And this is the power to transform us. If we feed and we feast on that. You can lift your eyes. Thank you, Lord, so much for what you've done for us, for who you tell us that we are. Friends, that's the power of salvation for all who believe. And it's that easy. We get to lay down our shame and we get to take up this nutrient that restores us, that makes us able to be replenished and able to enter this world and able to say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God, because I know it in my soul, I know it in my bones, I know it in my own transformation. And that's the kind of transformation that we have to know in our souls in order to be just as confident to say that we're not ashamed. So I would love for us to say this verse one more time. Stand up, nice and loud. (laughs) Let's activate this in us. Yeah, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord, so much for everything that you've done for us, for all the ways that you restore what the locusts have eaten, (laughs) what you renew, what was dead in us. And Lord, would you continue that process through in me, and would you continue that process through all of my friends here? that you would renew them in the good news. That you would keep exposing their shame, not not to harm them, but to free them. And would you keep restoring them with your truth and their identity in you? I give this all to you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen, amen. So friends, I know that one day thinking about our, the power of the gospel isn't enough. And so I made you a little like four-sided sheet that you can take on the way home and that you can anchor in this this week. Let God speak to you. Let him remove your shame. And he does this over a process, I believe. It's not always a one and done, a quick thing. But also my, um, my email address is at the bottom of that piece of paper. And if you need someone to sit with you and pray with you, you can reach out to me and we can schedule a time to just listen to the Lord or to look at that shame together. I know that in my own life, it is taking community that comes alongside of me that says you are loved, <laughs> you, you do belong. Like the Ananias in Paul's story that we need other people to show us that we are not ashamed because we are welcomed into God's kingdom. Let's worship.